Now, I am very pleased to introduce Derek Perkins. <laughs> Originally from the UK, Derek has narrated over 260 audiobooks in a wide range of fiction and nonfiction genres. After a career in export sales, export sales, and economic <laughs> development, he became, I'm sure he was an expert, <laughs> um, he became a profession, professional narrator in 2012. A move helped by his knowledge of three foreign languages, a facility with accents, and a lifelong love of the written and spoken word. In 2016, he won an Audi, the industry's top award, for the Highway Man by Kerrigan Byrne. The Society of Voice Arts and Sciences has repeatedly nominated Derek for Best Voice Narrator Awards, and Audiophile Magazine has named him a Best Voice of the Year in multiple categories. In 2016, Derek published the audiobook published the audiobook narration manual, prompted by conversations with aspiring narrators and wanting to understand the best, most effective ways of great ways of breaking into the audiobook business. <coughs> Let's give a warm <coughs> welcome to Derek Perkins. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, it's great to see you here. Thank you for coming out. Uh, before I get going, um, how many of you have had any involvement in audiobook narration or voiceover? I know there's at least two people in the audience who have. Well, there's the two. Any others? Well, three. Okay. Well, today I'm going to talk about two aspects of audiobook um, narration, the business of audiobook narration, and also talk about the art of audiobook narration. And I'll also tell you what audiobook narration isn't, which is specifically voiceover. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But first of all, let me uh, maybe tell you a little bit about myself. So I'll play you what I call my modesty slide. Uh, <laughs> so Kathy's covered most of this, but um, I guess uh, one of the first things to say is that I, I am, as you can tell, not young. I'm not old, but I'm not young. Um, so this is my second career. So I basically started volunteering as an audiobook narrator with Perkins School for the Blind in Watertown in 2010. And I have always had, as Kathy mentioned, a love of spoken word, performance, uh, and I wanted to, to uh, channel that in some way. So I found Perkins School for the Blind. Um, I began to narrate with them, for them, so I had a two for there. I was getting experience, but I was also having uh, the, the satisfaction of knowing that it was helping people uh, with uh, sight, uh, sight disabilities. Um, and then things moved very quickly, really, because in 2012, I, I, I started doing some work with the ACX. And I'll talk a little bit more about ACX later. Uh, and I just got in at the right time. I was in the right place at the right time. And I wish I could tell it was because of my supreme expert knowledge and pinpoint uh, marketing and research that brought me to that point, but it wasn't, it was just luck. So I was there at the time when the audiobook business started to explode, and this was about three years ago, four years ago, and so I was very fortunate in having a couple of publishers find me on ACX, and they came to me and they said, <coughs> would you like, because you can put demos on ACX, they said, would you like to do some work for us? And by the way, we're going to pay you. So there's only one answer to that. Um, and, and that really started the, the process. Um, things moved on from there fairly quickly. 2014, I was very happy to receive the first nomination, which was an audiophile uh, earphone award uh, for a book called The Venetians. And then in 2015, it was beginning to get to the point where I thought, OK, I, I, I now need to make the decision. Am I going to go full time with this? And uh, uh, and drop my other consulting work at the time. So I did, and it's been a fantastic um, decision, a fantastic journey, which I'm still on, and I'll, I'll talk you through as we go along. Um, the Audi came in 2016, and uh, other than meeting my wife and having my two kids with the wife, I have to say it's one of the best days of my life, mm -hmm. without equivocation. It was an unbelievable experience. And I say that not to say how good I am, uh, somebody thought it was, but I say that in all seriousness because um, it, it was a validation of everything I was feeling about what I was doing, and it was not always nice to get external validation, so I was, I was thrilled to have that. But anyway, enough about me. 
let's talk about me. So <laughs> I'm going to play you briefly some clips. Firstly, we're going <coughs> to play you a few audio, uh, clips from audiobooks I've narrated. And then I'm going to play you some clips from a couple of bits of voiceover that I've done. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the differences uh, later on. So the, the audiobook clips that you'll hear now will include some romance, they'll include some history, um, and one or two other things, just to give you a flavor for the kind of work I'm doing. I remember him well as I first saw him, a tall young man, fiery like my grandfather, with the blue eyes and reddish hair that I thought so beautiful in my mother. I will come with great haste as soon as my commission has ended, he'd written her, but not soon enough, as it turned out. Been up the cat and drunk half his Friday wage. Learned his letters, the boy, has he? Going to read to his old da finally then? This grand scheme would be launched as part of a broader campaign to extend the reach of papal influence beyond the confines of central Italy into Urban's birthplace and homeland, France. But up ahead were stone walls to keep out the rain, a roast turning on a roaring fire, and her room full of clean, dry clothing, another fire, and praise Christ and all the saints in heaven, a bed. They'd watch the waves bash against the black cliffs and laugh at the antics of fluffy red highland calves while speculating at length on just this very thing, what a naked woman looked like. So, quite a uh, Catholic eclectic range of uh, <laughs> content. Um, uh, there is certainly a variety of quality of writing that you deal with as a full-time audiobook narrator. Um, the more of that again, anon. So here's a couple of quick voiceover clips to give you a sense of the differences between audiobook narration and what voiceover s sounds like. Hello friends, let's talk about drinking and driving for a spell, or rather, not drinking and driving. But life isn't always as it appears. Innocent people forcibly incarcerated. Thought I'd lift the mood a little with that last one. <laughs> Um, so as I say, we'll talk more about audiobook narration and voiceover differences in a little bit. But first of all, just to give you a sense of the business itself and how it's grown over the years, you can see from this slide, pretty self-explanatory, 2011, 7,000-odd 7, books, audiobooks published. In, this is all in the U.S. And by 2016, the uh, latest figures we have for the full year are 50,000-plus audiobooks. So that, that's a massive, massive increase. Um, the... Business has grown in double digits basically ever since then. So, you know, you're talking about 12, 14, 16, 18 percent. Simon and Schuster last year, the quarter in uh, 2017, quarter one, said they had a 35 percent increase in their audiobook sales just in the first quarter. Um, Harper Collins said there was a 7 percent increase in the sales in their digital division, most of which would be audiobooks, again in, uh, in quarter one. And by now, the business is, is uh, running at about $2 billion a year in, in total revenue. So it's, it's a sizable business. Um, so how do people listen to audiobooks? The first bar here, smartphone 57%, gives you a sense of how and why this business has taken off as it has. Because as smartphones have become more and more ubiquitous, the demographic of people owning smartphones tends to be younger, and that demographic is one of the biggest factors for the takeoff of audiobooks. But it's a, it's a you know across uh, the, the whole range of smartphone owners, I guess. So whichever you look at, whether it's smartphone, desktop, tablet, there's all devices that allow people to consume this content in at the time and in the place that they want. It gives them maximum flexibility and maximum freedom to consume the content um, as, as they want to. And that's really been what's, what's driven this. You'll, you'll see the fourth bar down, the CD player. Um, this includes, well, let me, just, <coughs> let me just ask you to guess. Why is CDs so relatively important still in terms of how people listen to audiobooks? Why, why are we still getting CDs? Yes. In the car. There you go. That's it. I have no prizes other than the books, which have to be sold, <laughs> according to my accountant. But you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. So we still, you know, we still don't have every car that's Bluetooth compatible with smartphones and the like. 
So the, the car is helping to maintain the sales of, of CDs. Um, <coughs> all right, so that's how people listen. Where do people listen? Again, self-explanatory, but uh, the vast majority at home. And then, of course, people on the move, car and truck, uh, and then plane and, and, and the rest. Um, for the longest time, before the advent of digital content, one of the, I don't know how big the group is, but one of the, the, the most stalwart consumer groups of audiobooks was, believe it or not, truckers. And if you've ever been in a, um, I was going to say crate and barrel, cracker barrel, um, you'll see by the cash desk, they have these little revolving stands and they've got audiobooks on them. And the truckers would buy these as they go from, from place to place. They'd drop into the, to the cracker barrel, get their breakfast or whatever, and then they'd, they'd buy the audiobooks. Um, but it's, it's long gone on from there, obviously. I uh, always used to think, and I still do, that people would actually be doing something when they're listening to audiobooks. And I think that may still be the case. It's just that this is saying where they listen to them. But I think there's a lot of people who are doing things as they listen. Uh, and again, as I say, that's one of the... Oh, here we go. One of the, um, uh, one of the attractions of, of audiobooks. So I was slightly surprised at the first bar here that says people don't do anything, they just listen. Um, but... Um, that's fine. I'm rela relaxing before going to sleep. I don't know. <laughs> you could say some of it will put you to sleep. I don't know. But, um, uh, so as you can see again, you know, uh, w what you're really looking at is whichever one of these you pick, you can have a device in your pocket, on your arm or whatever, and you could be listening, whatever you're doing and wherever you are. So it's, be it's become the digital era has, has made a huge difference in terms of the, of the consumption of audiobooks. Now, for anybody interested in getting into the business, and I'll talk more uh, when we get into marketing uh, on this, but for a $2 billion business, it's a relatively small number uh, of publishers who are producing that, um, that revenue. And the ones on this slide here that I've shown, of, I mean, I, I, if I had to guess, I would say they represent probably 95% of the revenue of audiobooks in this country. Um, and uh, now that and that has a huge importance for when we start to think about anybody interested in getting into the business, certainly in a paid way. Uh, well, how do I go about it? How do I find the people who can give me business? It's a very small number, and they're very easy to get to. So that's another huge, huge plus to me, at least, having done a lot of um, business development and marketing in other sectors in in the past. It's it's actually f fairly easy. Uh, again, you can see from some of these publishers, they give away where they focus, Christian Audio, um, and uh, then you've got some of the really, really big places, Penguin Random House Publishing, you've got uh, Harper Audio is in there, Hachette, and some of these, Simon & Schuster, some of these account for really big, big volumes, lots of the blockbusters that you see coming out on uh, in audiobook format. So, now... <clears throat> I'm looking forward to this young gentleman here acing this next test. So the most popular genres, there are top three popular genres. I would invite you to give me your answers as to what you think is the most popular genre that people listen to. Yes, sir? Airport. No, 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 this is a genre what people are listening to, the type of Airport content. Airport novels. Airport novels. Yeah, but what type of novel? Not type Romances. of novel. Yes. Close, but no cigar. Modest Rippers. I'll get back to you in a minute. <laughs> Yes. Um, yes, you. Yes, sir. Christian books. Christian books. No. No. Nonfiction. Yes, but <laughs> what in nonfiction? Memoirs. No. Business. Science. No. Science. 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 No, absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> Mystery. Yeah. You win the star prize. Mysteries. Yes. Mysteries, thrillers, and suspense. Most popular category. Second most popular category. Romance. Real story glory. <laughs> and for several of you, particularly the front row section here, that seem to have this on their minds, the third one is romance. <laughs> um, just a quick aside, within the audiobook narration world, maybe beyond that too, um, you can get a sense that people consider romance not to be serious literature and that it's not really serious work to do. 
Well, I will tell you that romance uh, books are about a $1.2 billion business. They have <coughs> massive followings amongst women in particular. There are some men who listen to them. Um, and from an audio narrator's point of view, they are very nice to do because they're relatively easy to read. They're, they're bodice ripper was, I think, the term that was used. So, but, but they're page turner bodice rippers. Um, and authors will, will write whole series of them. And if they're happy with one book you do, they will then ask you to do the next one and the next one and the next one. So they become a little bit of an annuity <coughs> for your narration. So uh, anyway, those, those are the most three popular. And the lady at the back with science, I know you'd like to think, right? <laughs> but um, sa sadly, no, nothing that I think any of us would call serious content gets in here. Um, I've done a number of read what I consider to be really important uh, non-fiction or history related books and there's only two that have registered more than a blip on the radar um, just because it's just because whatever we're, we're not here to discuss that but the two that I have done that have been New York Times bestsellers uh, thanks to the author and I'll take no credit for that are two books called Sapiens and Homo Deus, and I would thoroughly recommend them to anybody who's interested in the history of mankind to date and the future of mankind from now. They're fantastic reads. Anyway, uh, I digress a little. So, talked about a little bit earlier about audiobook narration and voiceover. <coughs> so, um, here's here's where I break the two down because there's, there are very very different disciplines. For me, voiceover is all about uh, speed and small size, if you like. So in terms of, of, of literature, it's voiceover deals with words and lines. Audiobook narration deals in paragraphs and, and pages and chapters. Uh, audiobooks are, if you want a sporting analogy, audiobooks are a sprint. Uh, audio, uh, sorry, voiceover is a sprint, audiobooks are a, a marathon. Um, Voiceover is all about selling. Audiobook narration is all about telling. Um, and uh, voiceover, as you heard from the clips, always has some kind of effect on it. There's music, there's, there's you know, some kind of background effect or noise. Uh, audiobook narration, although we're now starting to see some full cast productions, some, some what in my uh, childhood we, we associate with BBC radio plays, we're now starting to see some of that coming in. By and large, the vast majority of, of, of audiobooks are narrated with just one voice and no effects. So that's, that's another big difference. Uh, voiceover is always directed. Uh, audiobook narration used to be for the most part, but as people have got more and more into home studios, the, the direction part has largely gone. Uh, I've never been directed in an audiobook, and I've done nearly 300 now. <coughs> Every voiceover gig I've had, I've always been directed. Um, and then the last, last point is, you know, voiceover is about understanding, when, you, when you're doing a voiceover, you're really trying to understand the customer. You're trying to sell something, you put yourself in the customer's position and make as, something as appealing to them as possible. If you're talking about audiobooks, you're trying to understand the author's viewpoint and you are doing your best to convey what's called the point, the author's point of view to the listener at the same time as making yourself almost invisible in the process. And you don't want people thinking of you, you want them listening to the content, thinking of the, the book that's being read. Uh, so a lot, uh, I, I, I hope I haven't uh, done this to death, but I, I take some time to, to explain this because there, there are a lot of people who will say, oh, you know, I know somebody's got great, but he does lots of, uh, he can mimic lots of people and do lots of characters and uh, could he do audiobooks? And the answer is, I, I don't know, but that's not the criteria for audiobook narration, um, particularly. Um, so the, the, the nature of audiobook work, my little cheesy graphics here, on the left-hand side, the guy running down the long, lonesome road all on his own, that's, that's a little bit like the audiobook narrator's life. You really spend an awful lot of time on your own. You don't have any direction. 
Um, it's, a, it's a real marathon. I mean, books I record that go from anything from four hours, most of them are about eight or nine, some of them have gone to 17, and the longest one, I think, was about 25 hours. And <clears throat> if you're going to do a book that lasts even nine hours, you're going to take probably a week and a half, I'll take a week and a half to do that. And you need to sound the same on the last day of recording as you do on the first day of recording. So your energy level, your diction, the pacing, all of that needs to be uh, very, very consistent. And that's, believe it or not, that's actual effort. Uh, that really is effort. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very big difference. Not to say voiceover is <laughs> bad. The voiceover actually pays much better than audiobook work. However, <laughs> um, voiceover is immensely competitive. You can get work from it, and, and good people will, but um, you'll get paid more. But by and large, audiobook narration is a more constant flow of business. And because it lasts for longer, all in all, for me at least, it, it represents a much, much better, better uh, way of earning my living than competing on voiceover work. Plus, as I say, for voiceover work, I have to go to a studio uh, in... Um, Boston isn't bad for voiceover work in studios, but uh, New York and LA are obviously the principal centers, and uh, and I, you know, I, I'd rather be in my home studio. Um, okay, so what else about the nature of audiobook narration, the art of it? Well, you don't just crack open the spine of a book. You don't do that anyway because you have it on your iPad. But uh, when I get to record a book, the first thing I've got to do before I go near the book is I've got to prepare for it. And preparing for a book is different for me, at least, based on whether it's a fiction book or it's a non-fiction book. If it's a fiction book, I have to have read a good proportion of it. So I know what the storyline is, I know who the characters are, I know where the location is, and I can begin to get my mind around how I'm going to do the voices and how I'm going to the tone I'm trying, going to try to give to the narration and so on. So I do take a lot of care to get that right. The mysteries are the worst ones for this. If you don't read a mystery or you don't search in the right way right through to the end of the book, you really can be caught because I have had this experience. I talk from bitter experience. Where I had narrated a book and I was three quarters of the way through and I'd been uh, narrating this one character as a French character and it turns out in this sudden plot twist, for which I'll hate the author forevermore, <laughs> uh, it turns out the guy was a Canadian. <laughs> so now I have to go back through the whole book and drop in those little sections of his voice and change it from French to Canadian. So that's no fun, so you have to know what, you know, what, the, what the author's about. Um, the point of view, as I said, is what really helps determine how you, how you characterize this book in the, in the narrative passages as well. Um, so that's, that's part of the prep. If I'm doing a, a non-fiction book, the prep will very light. I don't read non-fiction books beforehand. I know what they're about. I uh, doesn't, doesn't, hope that doesn't sound arrogant, but I, I, you know, I, I get it. I got the premise. Um, I do make sure I understand what the author's trying to say, but I don't read the whole thing. What I do do is I go through the whole thing for pronunciations. Um, and the, the blackest mark on my career to date, and I really am so sorry about this, is a book I did a number of years ago. It was a book called The Prime Ministers, and it was all about the Prime Ministers of Israel. It was a really interesting book, but it had lots of y Yiddish, uh, Hebrew uh, words and phrases. And I was given the research, so I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to diminish my responsibility in this, but I was given the research for this. And I did my best, but most of the reviews, if you go to Audible and look on the Prime Minister, yeah, you'll see some really zingy reviews, because it's basically, yeah, good book, shame about the narrator. Um, and it's, you know, I, I get that. That's, that's, that's fair. I mean, if you, I, I would never do that now, but that was in the earlier days. So uh, getting that prep right and getting that, that pronunciation piece right is critical and there are a bunch of websites you can go to where you can put the word in and then you hear the sound of the word which is fantastic then you have to learn phonetic script to translate what you've heard onto a spreadsheet to then have that to refer to as you're recording could we, um, come, could we come back briefly to an explanation of the picture on the right as yes. exemplifying voiceover 
It's, it's the picture on the right shows how old I look as I get to the end of a book, or I feel. Um, the picture on the right is, is intended to exemplify the, the, um, what audiobook narration is all about, as opposed to voice over, really. It's, it's telling a story to a, a, you know, a number of people listening. That's, that's all it is, really. Uh, and thank you for asking. And I should have mentioned earlier, by the way, if you have any questions at all or comments as I go through, please just shout them out. We've, We'll have time at the end, but I, I, I am happy to take questions or comments as we go along. Um, okay, so that's, um, that's research. So this is a quick uh, example of the spreadsheet that I prepare when I do my research. Um, you'll see on the top left pronunciations, author. This is a slightly unusual one because the author of this series that I've, I'm, I'm four-fifths of the way through, Fate Mark series, tremendous, if you like, um, fantasy, by the way, absolutely tremendous series. Um, but the author very kindly sent me um, an MP3 file with the pronunciations for all of the main characters. And I don't usually do this, but on the right-hand side here, these, these little uh, icons here, when I click on those, I can hear the author straight away, and it's, in, it's embedded in the spreadsheet. I don't usually get that fancy. Um, but then if you go to the second tab, it says pronunciations other. So, so there's, a, there's a whole bunch of other pronunciations. And because it's, it's fantasy, you know, there's no, there's no way you can look to see what these are like. And the author, bless him, said, look, you get these main characters right, and I don't care what you do with the rest of it. You, you make your own pronunciations <laughs> up. And that's what I do. So you'll see in the spreadsheet itself, the word is where I put what's in the book, and then the pronunciation is my... Uh, phonetic uh, transliteration of the sound. Yes? If, if you were to have gone through the book in the example you're talking about and, and say, you know, you're pronouncing it Smythe and it's Smith and yes. you know, you're going to wrong. I mean, can you just go back and record yeah. Smith in each spot? You don't have to read it all over again. No, no. Okay, you just sort of ramp into it? And yeah, about, yeah, oh, yeah okay, I can. Okay. So it's like, yeah. Start all over. That's a great question. I'll, I'll talk about that technique a little bit okay. uh, when we get to the recording session. Yeah. Um, so that's the, fundamentally that's the research piece and now I have this that's a spreadsheet so I've got this on my computer screen as I'm recording um, it's in the background if I need to refresh my memory on how a word's pronounced I'll stop recording I'll flip to the spreadsheet I'll read that remind myself flip back to this recording software and carry on it sounds very cumbersome but when you get into the flow of it it's actually you can do it very, very quickly, and it becomes quite quick and easy. Um, so that's the research part of it. Character voices, uh, this Fate Marked series is so far, and this is a feature of fantasy novels, it really is, they write long. So the first book was about 600 pages, the second was 700, third was about, they're, you know, they're all about 650 to 700 pages. So there's a lot of characters. Um, the most I've ever had in a fantasy series to date is 240 odd. And I suspect this is going to break that record by some measure. Um, but again, you know, I, I can't keep all those voices in my head or my memory. So what I do is when I get to a character, the first time I come across them, I will record the voice. I will then take a small clip, like three seconds worth of that voice, and I'll save it to a, an MP3 file and I'll put that on my computer in a folder for this particular project. And the same, same as the pronunciations. When I'm in recording, and I get to a voice, that the character hasn't been in the you know, book for a little bit, and I can't remember how I voiced them, then I just flip back, open up the file, and I hear my, um, my voice reading it. So then I'm good to go again. I also, yes? Have you ever had anyone question your consistency, through, especially across different different books in the series and I only asked because I was recently in the car and there's a series I listened to with my kids and they immediately said you know they're remembering what they heard from three books ago for a character that comes and goes yeah they're like that's that doesn't sound right yeah uh, how, how, how challenging is that when you get into as you said 240 plus it, 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 it is challenging and I, I have I have um, found on occasions that I've listened to different parts of a book and I've found myself slipping a bit. And that's one of the reasons now why often I will go back to the clip 
even if I think I know it, I'm going to go back to it just to make absolutely sure, particularly in a, in a long book as you go on. But it's funny you ask that question because in an, a review of one of the books recently, I had that very comment. And uh, I like the critical comments because they're the ones you learn from. Um, and so that's what the person said. They said, as, as you went through, this particular character started to blur and I couldn't hear it. So I thought it was great. So it is, yes, it, 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 it's something that you do need to be aware of. I will say I did have one review on Audible where the, the uh, review was, uh, I give you the abridged version. Uh, yeah, a decent book. Shame about the uh, narrator. Next time, get one without a speech impediment. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I marked them down as a troll. Because <laughs> they couldn't have been right. <laughs> Could they? Um, so again, we're talking of, uh, we're still on the art <coughs> side of it here, I guess. Uh, this isn't me. Mm -hmm. This is Kate Winslet. Kate Winslet, uh, as you probably know, British actress who does quite a lot of voice, uh, voice over audio book work. Um, so what does my day look like recording? Um, I get up, I have breakfast. I actually do some prep usually before breakfast, but uh, have breakfast, get myself well lubricated, a few beers, bottle of wine. That's <laughs> uh, water. <laughs> um, and then I'll get into the studio. Um, now I'll do about, this is just me, I'm not saying this is what you have to do, if, you know. Uh, but I'll do about an hour and a half of recording, and uh, every time I make a mistake that I catch, I'll stop and re-record it. Um, and then I'll stop, because believe it or not, it's actually very intense, and it takes a lot of concentration, and it takes a lot of effort to maintain that concentration. As I mentioned earlier on, particularly in this long form, you're having to keep, keep everything together. So I stop, and that's very deliberate, even though sometimes I feel like going on, most of the time I feel like stopping. And then I'll have a break. So then I'll have you know, tea, coffee, whatever it is, another beer. Um, <laughs> and then I will go back and I'll have a second session. So I basically do four sessions a day, four recording sessions a day, two in the morning, two in the afternoon. I take a break lunch times, that's when I choose to work out. And um, that's great, because then I feel refreshed going back into it. And then uh, likewise, the mid-afternoon break, and then last session, uh, and, and I'm done. So everybody's different though. Uh, you know, different people do it at different paces, different people can get through more or less or whatever. That's, that's what I've uh, got, to, um, got to, to, to do and to really like. It's a, good, it's a good pace for me. Now, talking about recording quickly. So what happens if you make a mistake? If you've got the right software, which I now do, um, if you make a mistake, the software now exists so that you simply go back, you, you do it at the sentence level usually, although if the sentence is long, you can split it. But you just go back from, you, immediately you made the mistake, you realize it, you stop, you put your cursor back to a suitable gap, and then you just record over. Uh, the software exists to allow you to, to put, put a, a particular defined parameter within the recording so that you're not going to go over, you're not going to start until, until a certain point, you're not going to carry on beyond a certain point. So you're, you're not going to mess up other recording you've done. And that's the way it's done. And I do that every time as I record. Yes, sir? Do you do one book at a time or do you do several? Or? I, I, yeah, by, by preference, I try and uh, arrange it, if I can, that it, I do one book at a time uh, to help me maintain the Stay flow. In, yeah. yeah, exactly. I have occasionally done two, uh, uh, you know, consecutively, but uh, yeah, most of the time I, I can. Um, and that, um, that, so that technique of recording your own mistakes or over them is known as punch and roll. Sounds like a boxing analogy, but it, um, but it's it's uh, that's that's what it is. And it, it different. Yes. Oh, I was just wondering if you could say a word about pace. So when you're recording this hour and a half, I mean, sometimes I, I did a little bit of a voiceover a few years ago, and I was in the studio, and the engineer kept saying to me, "You need to slow down." Yes. And I would say it exactly the same way. <laughs> and he said, "You need to slow down." I, I yes. just couldn't, you know. So. Can you say a little bit, is there, is there any, not, not so much magic formula, but so many words per minute, or what's a good pace you can, uh, a uh, Yeah, no, it's a very good question. Uh, f firstly, I know, because we spoke earlier, you're a speaker, mm -hmm. and, and I've done a little bit of speaking, and I think you'll agree, m most, most people who have stood up in front of me will agree that 
silence is incredibly intimidating when you're speaking in front of a group. And, and I, I was a Toastmaster for a number of years, and one of the most difficult skills to learn was to shut up um, at the right point and allow the pauses to add the power to what you're saying and add effect. So I think my answer to you is that it's like a speaker gets more uh, experienced, they become more confident with silences. We used to have a guy in the Toastmasters Club who would demonstrate his skill with this. He'd, he'd say, and you know, of course, we must remember that pausing. <laughs> and we're all going, yeah, we get it. <laughs> um, so you can overdo it too. But, um, but I think as you gain, gain experience, you gain confidence, that's how you can better manage your pacing. Uh, but it is something I hope I do it better now. When I was starting out and when I got coaching, uh, I, that's one of the first things they said to me, slow down, slow down. In fact, one, one guy said to me, slow down. He said, because you know what? The slower you are, the more time it takes, which means you get paid more. <laughs> <laughs> so that was very nice of him because he was a producer. Um, so that's what I would say. I would say, you know, do that. But, but equally, I think your pacing has to match the content, right? So when I'm doing these fantasy books, which, which involve a horrendous amount of fighting and there's always blood and guts and everything. Um, but they also have some tender little, you know, relationship scenes too. And so when I'm doing the fighting things, I'm speaking quite quickly. Uh, and then, you know, when you get to the kissy kissy bits, you're just going to go softer and, and, and pace it out a little bit. So does that? It does help a bit, yeah. yes. I think it's a matter of just, and I'm right now working on a business book. So there's not characters, it's you know, right. business principles. And so yes. it's a lot, not as involved as having characters in that sense, but I'm, I find myself, as I'm recording myself, I, I need to listen back to it now. I'm still thinking I'm going too fast. So yeah. I think it's deliberately just trying to slow down. Like yeah. Allow for pausing. Yeah, yeah, and, and, you know, I think that's one of the uh, things about trying to put yourself in the listener's position, too, because uh, if, you, if, if you listen to something and it's, it's coming through too quickly, it's actually quite stressful as a listener because your mind is, you're trying to digest the content and then the, the, the speaker's moved on. And it's really tough to, you know, most of us have difficulty holding two things in our heads at the same time and all that. So, so, so the more you, you pause and the more you pace uh, at, a, at a reasonable rate, then the, the better it is. Um, although I have to say too, there are a lot of people because of the devices that they listen on now that speed it up. I think particularly younger people. They'll play them at one and a half times because they haven't got time for anything. <laughs> so they'll put it on one and a half times and get through them quicker. And well, that's fine, you know, whatever. But Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, okay, so, so there is uh, the, so the recording piece. So I did the four sessions. Errors. Now, here's a funny thing about errors. I get my... Um, yeah, we'll get onto that now. So I get my... Uh, my, I do my books, send them off, huge sigh of relief, wonderful, uh, kind of move on to the next one. And then you get the day when you have the email that says, right, we've got the corrections in now. Because what happens when you record professionally, you send your files off that you've done, you've caught your errors in your studio at the time, you send your files off, and then your publisher has a proofer listen to every minute of what you've done. And what the, you see here is the way, this is an actual spreadsheet of uh, corrections. They will mark up noises, which are the, the column with the ends in it, and they will mark up the author, the uh, reader's errors. And I never fail to be amazed by how many errors you don't catch. Uh, this one, um, you see that one on line 77 where it's, it's got the M in that, row and it says Gil Loren and then along here it says King Gil Loren. Well that's because I missed out the word King. Now I miss out whole phrases. I get them back sometimes they say you missed this sentence out and I look at it it's like four lines long. <laughs> I think where was I? <laughs> I don't know but um, so it's a funny thing uh, so you just can't catch all your own mistakes it's, it's you know and it's pointless getting bent out of shape about it. I will say though in all modesty one of my goals for a while now has been to get a book with zero corrections. And I got it this year, last year, back end of last year. 300 odd pages, they're only little pages, so probably really, really it was about 150. And I got the email back and the guy said words to the effect of, um, 
Well, we've tried, <laughs> but, but we couldn't find any errors. So that was great. Um, well, 14 after 22 hours, that's not so bad. Oh, this is only a portion of the spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's. So what are the noises? Oh. The cat meows, cat meows you know, like that. Uh, uh, yeah, mouth. I uh, hear, hear. Right. How long have you got? So it's it's mouth clicks. I have a this. I stand up now when I record, uh, because sitting's a new, killing disease apparently. So I stand up. I like. I prefer it now anyway. Um, so I stand up and I have the thing called a Vary desk, which you can pop on a normal desk and you can pull it up and it brings everything up higher. So then I'm, I'm in the mid-sentence and I'm flowing beautifully and all of a sudden, click, the desk clicks. And so it'll do, that'll do it. Um, if I occasionally I get excited and I move my head forward too much, my earphones will bash against the microphone. So that'll do it. Or I'll be fl flinging my arms around and then it'll, it'll touch the, the desk. So that does it. And then what's happened recently, I don't know if this is a sign of getting old or not, but sometimes I'm, do, I'm just about to talk and my jaw clicks. So then I have to stop. To, it's crazy. And I think, well, I've got a limited lifespan here because there's lots of bits that can click and go wrong, right? So anyway, so it's... So then you go back and you have to edit those out. Exactly, yes. And it's, it's most annoying when I'm, I've got through a sentence, particularly if it's a tricky sentence, and I've, I'm aware halfway through there's a desk has clicked. It's not so bad if it's your own, mis you know, desk has clicked and then you've got to go back and redo it, uh, the sentence or whatever. Uh, but mouth clicks definitely, dry, dry mouth is a nightmare. Um, and uh, the, so the ends there can be for, for all of the above and, and possibly more. And I do try to minimize that, but it's, it's really tough, particularly when you're in full flow. Sometimes I'm in full flow, I, I can't hear the clicks, the desk, because you just, you're just banging away. Yes. Sir. So you're making, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, we'll get to the gentleman in front now. Uh, when you're making corrections, so, all right, the settings that you use in the software, and not just the proximity <coughs> to the mic, but all the, the, all the settings for decibel levels and sound profiles and all that, so, uh, they consist of, do you use the same settings across all your books, or are there specific settings that they like you to use for different books? Because what I'm thinking is obviously going back to making corrections, you want to make sure that you're yeah. punching things in at the same yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. I will come to it later on in more detail, but the simple answer is, yeah, the settings stay the same. Okay. Mine, at least. Gentlemen in the So front. rather than reread a part, if there's something small like a click or a squeak, can't you just cut that, that little two milliseconds out? They do. Uh, these are the ones they can't. Ah. Yeah, 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 you're absolutely right. They do if they can, but uh, sometimes they just can't. Oh, they do for you. They do it for me, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, 99% of the time, I only read, only. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, they'll, they'll do that uh, for you if they can. So what you get back are the ones they haven't been able to get out because they're too noisy or, you know. Oh, stomach gurgles is another one. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I tell you what I have been doing recently though, to, to, and I do believe it's helping, is, I don't know if you've heard of this drink called kombucha. It's a, a probiotic drink. It's like a slightly fermented, uh, drink <laughs> and uh, it comes in different flavors and it I find it really does a great job it does settle my stomach and it, it, it leads to a lot less of those noises because they can be really problematic I've had times when I've been narrating after lunch and I've literally had to stop for about five or ten minutes to let this symphony you know, <laughs> reach its crescendo so that brings up the question of do you have uh, warm water that you sip when you're not on, uh, the, you know, on the record yeah I have um, I have this in the studio, uh, away from my equipment. I have a little table behind me, and it's just got water. It's not warm. It's 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 cold, but it's not iced. Okay. So it's it's regular water, and that's all I do. I don't. Somebody told me a while ago, oh, cider vinegar. The opera singer started to take it, and it's really good for you. And then, as I was doing a bit of research for this presentation, I I googled um, you know vocal cords and and things like that, and I find that apparently. When you gargle it, it doesn't touch your vocal cords. Oh, no, so when you gargle it does, but if you drink, the liquid doesn't touch your vocal cords. Mm -hmm. So then I thought, well, I'm spending a lot of money here for nothing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, but I do, I do um, yeah, I drink as much water as I can during the day, regularly, and I drink kombucha to help with it. Somebody recommended to me is that there's a spray called Entertainer's Secret, <laughs> and it's, it, it does work. It, does it? Yeah, it, one, of the, one of the coaches that suggested it, and it, you just spray the back of your mouth. 
Yeah, I don't know. I'm not familiar it's, with that. It's pretty, it, it, it is pretty good for mouth noises. Is it? Yeah. Do you know what's in it? Uh, it's all natural. It's natural oils and, um, right, right. yeah, there's no chemicals. Or yeah. No, I, I haven't, I haven't heard of that. Thank you. Um, okay. So, that, fundamentally, that's corrections. I will just say this about corrections, too, though. It is an important part of the business. Um, it's an inevitable part of the business. <coughs> and it's also a tricky part of the business. Because in all seriousness, when you've finished a book, you, you really, you know, you, you mentally, you switch off a little bit. You say, I'm done with that. Then you're half, you know, you're two or three days into another one. Then you get this dreaded email. And they generally want corrections within about two days. So now you've got to force it into your regular schedule, and you've got to get your head back into that old book, and you've got to remember that. Now, a, a lot of clients will send you what they call a voice reel, and it, where, where they take recordings of the part that you made a mistake in, which is really helpful. Um, and if they do, that becomes much easier. If they don't, and there's a character voice, and even if there isn't, most of the narrative, you've got to make sure you're matching that tone, pace, diction, the whole thing. And so if they don't provide it, you've got to go and find it in the file. They will provide the time stamp. You see on the third column in there where it says 2.18 at the top and then 2.22 and so on. That tells me that's 2 minutes 18 into that file. So I know where the file is, but it's picky and it's easy to resent corrections. <laughs> but my, my, and you don't get paid any more, of course, because the, the deal is you record and then you have one round of corrections they get for nothing. Well, one and only. So you, you're not getting any extra money for this. But increasingly, my, my approach is these people have paid me to do this book. I'm a professional and I've got to help them make this book as good as it possibly can be. And if you're not paying attention to corrections, I don't know if you've heard it. I hear it in audiobooks. You can tell where they've been dropped in. And a bad correction is really going to stick out. So I don't, I don't want to do that. But it can, be, it can be tricky psychologically. Yes, sir? In terms of this noise question, do you read from a physical book or a digital book? So uh, you don't end up paint turning or that sort of Yes, thing? yes. Uh, the, uh, I read from a, an iPad. So that when I get sent scripts, I get sent a PDF file pop it onto my iPad, and that's what I use. And then there's no page turn issues. It's, uh, it works a dream. Funnily enough, uh, two weeks ago, one of my best clients came to me and said, we'd like you to read a book. So I'm not looking forward to that very much. But, um, but yeah, so be it. The, uh, the rest of it's all, all PDF, thank goodness. And the PDF, of course, has the other benefit when you're preparing, as I mentioned earlier. If I get a character and I'm not sure, I don't have to worry too much about this, um, how much does this character appear? You can just search. You get the character's name, you search uh, through the rest of the PDF, and you can find out, are they, you know, are they really important, and so on. So do you end up sending them the whole book back corrected, or just the deltas? No, I, um, just the corrections themselves, yeah, thankfully, yeah. Um, the worst I've had for corrections has probably taken me about an hour and a half. Most corrections will take me about half an hour to three quarters. I'll come back to you in a second. Yes? I'm just wondering if you're working from a PDF on your iPad, so you don't go in and do you know, lot pauses or underline or mark up your script? No, it's not to say that you shouldn't. A lot of people do do that. Yeah, yeah. I just don't operate. You, you, that's more of a voiceover thing. I've done that in voiceover, okay. um, where every single word is, uh, is critical. That um, second clip I played you was actually, <laughs> we haven't got time for me to get into it, but uh, it was actually done for the Scientologists, um, just to show how open-minded I am. And if there's any Scientologists in the room, that's fine. I'm under a contract not to say anything bad about them, so we're good. <laughs> but in all seriousness, they, they paid for me. They had a bit of a crisis, I suspect. They found my voice. They paid for me to fly to L.A., they put me up in a hotel, rented a car, got out to their Sea Org place, which is the one in the desert that you see on the documentaries about people escaping from. <laughs> so I got in there, and it was a fantastic, really interesting experience. The facilities they have got are like nobody's business. They have got studios there that can uh, accommodate full symphony orchestras. They can make movies. The uh, recording studio I was in was probably the space of from the first or second row all around here, just for me. And then uh, outside, the engineers 
were stopping me every sentence. A lot of the time they were stopping me before I'd even finished a sentence and say, we want you to emphasize that word more. We want you to say this better. But, but uh, it's a slight digression, but um, there are a number of narrators who will take a PDF and they'll mark it up and they'll put pause breaks in, they'll underline things, they'll <coughs> color code for characters, and more power to them. But I, I don't operate like that. And it, it's, to me, that's a little too much. But if it helps, have at it. And is the uh, PDF just just the book, or is it a script, basically? It's the, um, it, yeah, it's, it's a book. What, what you generally get is either a, what I consider a properly formed PDF, an adult PDF, um, which doesn't have any funky edges or whatever, so it's just you know, a full page. But what you often get are the PDF, um, I'm not sure of the term actually, but anyway, it's the, it's, the, it's the PDF they'll send to the printer. So it has the little marks in the top and the bottom, so the printer knows what size the pages have to be and all that. That's not so good, it's a finicky point, but that's not so good because then the text tends to be a bit smaller, um, and I don't want to be constant. But yeah, so it's, it's just a regular, yeah, regular old book. We have another question here. So are you paid um, contractually, do you bid, bid a job or are you paid by the hours? I will come right back to that. There are, I, I will say there are two basic ways a, an audiobook narrator gets paid. One is per finished hour, and I'll explain that in a second, PFH. The other is royalty. But the answer to your question is no, I never, I never bid for a book because I'm, I'm I'll get back to this. <laughs> um, okay, so that's that's uh, corrections. So the voice. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. It took me a while. Yeah, <laughs> I, I did want to put a graphic up here, and I, I googled vocal cords, and it was so horrendous. I thought, no, I couldn't. It was it was putting me off my lunch. So uh, so I put this up instead. Um, but I will say a few quick words about the voice. Um, the first thing is that because you're using a microphone, you don't really strain your voice. Um, you shouldn't be straining your voice because the microphone is taking all of your vo vocal power and it's doing it for you, as it were. You'll hear, you know, there's, there's a tremendous number of pop singers in particular who have vocal surgery, vocal cord surgery, um, and that's because they're not using their voices properly, even with microphones. But the audiobook business is good, and, and it's one thing I have, the only thing I've really worried about in any serious sense is, well, you know, I do this all day, every day, is it, is it going to have an impact? But I can tell you, and um, my colleague Joe from the choir I sing in here, uh, in, in Boston, Boston Sangerfest, we, we rehearse two and a half hours every Monday night, we sing in concerts, and that, that doesn't cause a problem either, mainly because we're, um, we're singing within ourselves, most of us, right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so it's not straining the voice. So, so, so that's not too much of an issue. Uh, but the, the keeping the voice hydrated is, uh, is critical, and I can't emphasize that enough. That, that will get you into problems if you're not uh, really lubricating your voice. The other, the other key aspect, I think, for the voice is um, character voices. Uh, you have to be very careful if you're voicing a character and you're straining your voice to voice the character. A rough, you know, I give a lot of characters a rough, gravelly, you know, He-Man type sound. All the, the Highland romances, I, you know, she's up, I can't wait to see her again. Oh, God. Uh, all that kind of stuff. But if there's a character that has huge uh, amount of dialogue, that can get very wearing. So I, I tend to be careful of that. Um, but otherwise, uh, if you shout, it's going to distort the sound anyway, so you can't really shout. So if you've got to do a loud projection all of a sudden, the mic technique that I use is a very simple one. You just turn your head to the side, so the sound is being dissipated, because the microphones that we use are so powerful, it's going to, it's, you'll blow them up otherwise. Um, okay, so we talked about noises earlier on. Um, and the other thing about voices, here's, here's one other really important thing about voices, is uh, a lot of people say, well, what about, how do you do a woman's voice? And uh, of course, how you don't do a woman's voice is to do a falsetto hmm. as a man. And the same for the, for the women narrators. Female narrators uh, don't need to drop into the lowest possible register and growl away. 
the, the, the way I try to approach the female voice as a male is simply to change, I, try, I literally do try to put myself in their shoes, not literally, but, <laughs> um, but I do try to get myself into that mindset and thinking, thinking I'm a different person. And I, I try, what I do is I change the, the intonation, I change the cadence, and I'll soften my voice a little bit. And, and that does it. And it's the same for, for female narrators too. You don't have to go all huff and gruff, you know, just because you... There's, the more I've been doing this, the more I'm interested when I hear voices, and sometimes you hear a female voice, and it actually sounds very much like a, a male voice. Anyway, so, so there's a whole range. So I, I, I make sure that that's, that's the way I do it, uh, so it doesn't become a caricature. Um, okay. Well, actually, that, yes. that's a question, too. So when, let's say there's a particular character, uh, you know, like a rogue kind of character, and... You find you find yourself three books later in a different series, having to say to yourself, "Here's another rogue character, but I've got to on purpose not try to be like that one from three books ago." Yeah, you do? yeah, definitely, definitely. Now, the the one saving grace is that even like I said, the extreme is when you get a fantasy series and you got two hundred and fifty odd voices. The saving grace is that you never get a scene when they're all together. <laughs> <laughs> so you can get away with some voices actually sounding a little similar, um, and and because they they don't appear in the same scenes even, uh, it's it's okay. Yeah, yeah. But but you're right. I mean, there's only ultimately there's only so so much you can do. And and the other thing I'm beginning to learn a little bit as more I, as I get more experienced is that that I don't worry quite so much about making a voice sound totally and utterly different. It's a little bit like the female voice thing. I try to make the voice correspond to the character rather than necessarily giving them a, you know, this massive accent or this massive <coughs> effect. Uh, okay, so we'll move on quickly to, you know, reasonable amount of time remaining. So, so if you're a, a, a wannabe or if you are in any way interested in doing narration, even if you don't think that you want or could get to the point of being paid, you want to volunteer, there's, there's a lot of opportunity to do that. So here's my, and by the way, shameless plug, everything I've talked about today is in the book. So f f for those of you who may be interested in taking this on further, everything and more uh, is explained in the book here. But there's, there's, it's very easy to get experience. So these four you can do with almost minute, well, the Two of them you can do with almost minimal experience. LibriVox and Learning Ally. LibriVox is an organization that has a, a simple mission. It just wants to bring uh, every uh, book that's out of copyright um, into a creation as an audiobook. Sim pure and simple. So they don't have any, there's no issues for content for them. Um, and as a result, they are the least demanding of their narrators. Uh, so for a beginner, they're, they're, they're really, really good. They don't require sophisticated equipment. They don't require you to make commitments. You do it in your own time. You can do it by the chapter of books. You can do it by whole books. Um, it's very, very flexible and very, very easy. Um, and they also do provide proofers to help you get through your mistakes, which they don't all do. Learning Ally uh, is, uh, used to be called Reading for the Blind and Dyslexic. And they used to have a studio in Cambridge, actually. I, I did volunteer for them quite a while back for a little bit. But Learning Ally is what they're called now. And they, a little bit like Perkins, they provide services to um, people with learning disabilities, all sorts of learning disabilities, including sight, but, but others too. And uh, so with Learning Ally will tend to be, you, you will get books, you know, fiction books as well, but you will also get a lot of text books. And uh, that's, a, that's a different animal. Some people will love that, others will find it tough. I have to say I found it a little little tough because, you know, you're reading a science book and it's chart one, graph four, table 19, and, and you have to explain them. You have to read them and explain them. Or you get an art book and there's a picture, you know, it's like a, a classical a picture from antiquity, and you get to it and they, they say, right, now you just describe it. <laughs> oh, right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that's slightly different type, but, but both of those, LibriVox and Learning Ally, allow you to record from your home. So again, it's a very, very low bar to entry, as it were. And uh, that makes it a great way of getting into business. Because I will say, just quickly, 
it's not for everybody. Um, and you have to find out, you know, before you make too much of a commitment, one way or the other, you have to find out if this is for you. Because not everybody can hack this. Um, and that's not being critical. It, it's just some people don't. I've got a friend who does a lot of voiceover. He started to get into audiobooks and he said to me, I, can't, I don't know how you can do this. I can't stand being cooped up all day long. So, you know, it's, it's a good way of testing that out too. Can you sit in a darkened space for hours on end, not talking to anybody, and uh, having no social contact? So, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it has its advantages too. You don't do any meetings in this business. <laughs> no meetings. <clears throat> Uh, the Perkins School for the Blind, uh, I can't speak highly enough of them. I narrated for them for, I don't know, what, seven years or something. They um, bring it to a slightly next level because they require you to do a, a uh, demo for them. They require you to go to their studio to record the books. And that's good because it's a way of gaining studio experience. And that includes studio etiquette. So, you know, there are certain things you do and don't do when you get into a studio booth, like you don't get in and slam the door shut. Because <laughs> that disturbs, that puts a correction in every other booth's recording. <laughs> um, and uh, you don't fiddle around with a microphone. I, I had a, a, one of my, <coughs> the guy who was my monitor, you do an hour's reading and then you do, you have someone who monitors you and then they read and you monitor them. So you're picking up corrections. Mm. And the guy that... Uh, used to monitor with me. He was a great guy. I loved him. But he would always fiddle with the microphone. And one day he actually dropped it. I knew it was going to happen. He <laughs> dropped it on the desk. And there's nothing worse than that sound of a microphone dropping on a hard <laughs> object. So uh, he fiddled around and they got it back. But So you don't touch the microphone. Um, stuff like that. But um, uh, Perkins School for the Blind will do all the proofing and then they'll come back to you and say, all right, here are the corrections. So that's a great way of getting experience too. But the big kahuna... 800 pound gorilla in the, uh, on the slide is ACX. For those not familiar, ACX is Audiobook Creation Exchange, which is uh, an entity in and of itself, but it's owned by Audible, which in turn is owned by Amazon, who now owns everybody in this room. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, um, but but uh, ACX is phenomenal for anybody who wants to get narration experience. So I'll just step you quickly through what happens. Um, Again, you don't have to prove yourself, you don't have to do anything uh, to get started. So you, can, you sign up, and you can get a profile page. And you can see from here, it allows you to put your mugshot on it. It allows you to put an enormous amount of information on it. Uh, so if you go down underneath my photo there, Derek Perkins, and then there's a bit of blurb where you can put how great you are. Hmm. Then it's underneath that, it's available for, and then you can put in your rate, if you're charging a rate, or if you're doing it for royalty, you just you can put that in, or you can put it as as both. And underneath that, um, you've got the bo bottom here. You've got a place where you can put samples. These are your demos, and that's fantastic because they're not limited. You can put as many up as you want, so you can showcase yourself all you like. And here's the thing: even though you may not have experience, you can just create demos, you know, at home in your home studio and put those up. Um, so you, you, that, you can showcase yourself that way. The About tab is what it says. just gives you the chance to say a little bit about yourself and what you think your strengths are, what you can bring to narration. Credits, if you've had any you know, gongs or favorable whatever's reviews or whatever. And then awards and recognition is prizes and, and so on. <coughs> so that's basically what you do to get yourself set up on ACX. <coughs> so that's, the, that's, that's one part. I should have... Just very quickly, I'll backtrack one. So think of ACX as an online marketplace. So on the one side, you've got authors, and on the other side, you've got people who want to narrate books. So it's a way, it's a mechanism using the internet for bringing the authors and narrators together. Uh, in a lot of cases, the authors will ask people to audition. In some cases, they don't. Um, but that's fundamentally what it is. There's no cost. There's no fee to sign up. Um, so you, you can set your profile page up. I've thrown this slide up. The, the, there are um, filters that you can apply to get to the type of work that you may or may not want to do. Uh, but I didn't filter this just to show you. This is, shows there's about 1,700 titles available. These are, these are all the books that authors have on ACX that they want narrators for. So there's a lot of work out there. Um, 
I will say though, just to manage your expectations, there's there's thousands of narrators too, but you know that's that's how it is. Um, so, so do, you, do you propose to read that, or do they wait? Do they find you? Uh, could be both. Could be either or. Um, you click on the book. <coughs> The book will bring you to their page. It'll have an audition link. It'll give you the script for the audition, and you can upload your audition. And then they'll let you know good, bad, or indifferent. So you have authors who know you and call you for narration. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, you do. And that's uh, I, I had that actually uh, early on. Uh, one of the narrators, uh, sorry, authors, did exactly what you'd said too. They contacted me and said, "Would you?" This was a romance, the writer actually. And this, funnily enough. This is how it can happen. So she contacted me, she said, would you like to do my book? I said, yes, I would. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and that was for royalty, so that's fine. So I did that, she liked what I did, then she wrote another book, she, said, she came back to me, she said, would you like to do the next book? So it went on, and as I said, the, you know, ro- romance writers write in, in, uh, in series, by and large. Over time, she went to a publisher, and she said to the publishing house, I would like Derek Perkins to continue narrating my books, which they agreed to, which is very nice. And so it turns out that it was her book, or one of her books, for which I won the Audi. That's a nice uh, little chain of uh, events, isn't it? So you never know where, where it can lead to. So sometimes authors may come to you if they like your voice, but otherwise you pick the book that you think looks interesting, you do the audition, and then you wait to hear. Uh, and you can do as many as you like. There's no, there's no limit. You can put as many auditions in as you like for books. Yes. Are you in a union? Yes, I am. Is there any? How does that impact? And were you when you started? And how does mm-hmm. that impact? The, you know, some of the people only hire union or only hire non-union. Um, no, uh, you, you with ACX <coughs> you can do either. Doesn't matter if you're in union or not. If you're in the union, you can get paid, uh, and you can get allocation made for your retirement and your pension. Um, uh, when I started off I wasn't in the union but I quickly joined the union because the union has been fantastic in bringing a level of parity to the publishers and so they've created scale rates uh, which are minimums which help narrators earn a reasonable wage so the union I have nothing but good things to say about publishers have slightly different views I'm sure but uh, by and large it's it's, um, I I don't feel that they're um, they're an over-intrusive union. What they've done, is, in my experience, they've brought rates up to a sensible level, and then there are publishers who pay above those rates to certain narrators. But yes, yeah, so I'm in the union. You do not have to be in the union to narrate for any publisher. Which, is it AFTRA or? Yeah, SAG-AFTRA. The, 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 it was the Screen Actors Guild, and they amalgamated. Yeah, yeah. So you've got you've got your cornucopia of choice there for. Uh, for your ACX and for getting experience. Um, and as I said earlier, the, you know, the benefits of doing ACX work or even volunteering is you're trying it out, seeing how it feels, does it appeal to you, do you like it, do you enjoy it? Um, and then when you get to ACX, a lot of people, as I said, are critical of ACX because you do get a lot of self-published books, so the quality can be variable. But um, a lot of people are sniffy about it because they say, ah, oh, it's not real literature, it's self-published. and well. Uh, my view on that was, I, I'm, I'm, when I started off, I wanted to learn as much as I could, and I wanted to get as much experience as I could as possible. And so I did as many ACX titles as I could. And my viewpoint is, I'm getting royalties for this. I'm getting paid to learn. So this is not a bad deal. Mm-hmm. Now, does it make me a lot of money? Well, you know, the Lexus, the Porsche, the Tesla, um, <laughs> or cars I'd like, but it doesn't pay enough for that. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I park my bike, chain my bike to the railings as I <laughs> <laughs> arrive today. Uh, no, it doesn't pay a lot of money, but you get royalties for seven years, and these books sell every month. So to me, that's, that's a good deal. Um, anyway, uh, yes? Just on that topic, do you have a preference between royalties and getting paid? Well, I, I do, and the, 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 the serious answer is my preference is per finished hour, and I should explain this in a sec, um, simply because then you get your money. A royalty is going to pay you dribs and drabs. Over seven years, it probably will pay you what you might have got per finished hour. In some cases, it won't. So I prefer the certainty of having that rate you know, a- a- applied. However, you know, 
occasionally someone hits pay dirt and they narrate a book for royalty and the book goes gangbusters and then you look clever you know then it's lovely um, and I will tell you a quick quick story it's not quite that but uh, do, you rem do you remember a book called uh, book movie audio book called The Martian mm -hmm. uh, it turned out that uh, Matt Damon uh, started it well The Martian started, out, started life as a, uh, a, a self-published book and the author was giving away chapters for free on the internet um, it came to the attention of Podium Publishing one of the audio book publishers I work with who are quite an innovative group and uh, independent publisher and they said we like the sound of this we're going to get this into an audiobook so they did the narrator's a great guy uh, did a wonderful job of the narration the audiobook started taking off like a rocket um, such that now the print publishers got interested so that for once they were behind the curve so the audiobooks first the prints next so then they get to him and they give him a deal so then he gets a print deal and then lo and behold the print book goes gangbusters and before you know it he's got a movie deal and Matt Damon starring in his movie and everyone rides off into the sunset and in their Teslas. Um, <laughs> but uh, the guy who narrated it, Bob Bray, did not do it for royalty. However, Podium being a pretty neat company they are, I know that uh, they made him a lump sum payment um, to uh, compensate him for the wild success wow. of this book. That doesn't often happen. Um, so just to, just to clarify, per finished hour, if, if I read a book, the book in a format that a listener will hear lasts for eight hours, that's, all, that's what I'm going to get paid for. It's my rate times eight hours. If the book takes me ten hours to record, I don't get paid for that extra two. So in other words, I'm not paid for the mistakes I make. I'm just paid for what they accept as the final... Uh, final recording. Um, let's just say that you pick one of these and the author of Monk Man Candy says, yeah, I'm going to have you do this. And you do it and then it becomes a wild success. And they say, you know, I'd like to get someone different to do this. Can you be bumped out and then a new... Yeah, it's entirely up to them. Uh, there's, there, there's, there's, to the best of my knowledge, you do get into contracts with ACX because they all generate it automatically. But there's no, um, it's book by book. So uh, you, you, what, what I would do in a situation like that, if, if you know, things were going well and you knew there, was more, there were more books coming up, I'd be talking to the author about, can we get into a, some kind of arrangement so you have me cover the books? It works in reverse too, because I've heard of narrators who say, I've committed to you know, seven books for this fantasy writer, and after one, I, I'm, I'm, you know, <laughs> I feel like <laughs> I can't go on. So sometimes it works the other way around too. Uh, okay, so um, let's talk quickly about set, setting up a home studio. This is my studio. This is my world. This is my life. <laughs> you would never know how many adventures you can have in a small dark box in the basement of your room, uh, house. So this is the deluxe, if you want. Uh, I didn't get this immediately. I waited until I looked like I was, I was going to hack it. Um, this is what's called a whisper room. So the one on the left-hand side shows you the outside, um, and it's a, it comes flat-packed, like an IKEA, like a, the most nightmarish IKEA product. <laughs> and uh, believe it or not, it, come, it assembles with screws and a screwdriver, nothing else, no other tools needed. So, um, but the panels are devilishly heavy, so you really need help. So then the, the one here, obviously, is the, is the inside of, of my studio. Um, so let me ask you this. If you want to set up a home studio, what do you think is the most important criteria for, that you have to take into account when you're putting a home studio in in your house? Noise. Outside noise. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's it. It's, funny, it's a very good group. Well done. Because other groups, most groups say, uh, you know, it's got to be here, there, or everywhere, or they, they give all sorts of different answers. Noise is the one. Noise is the one. Um, I know Don from talking to you, you talked about the furnace kicking some in. You, you have to. Control, some you can't. Yeah, exactly. Uh, where I am now, I'm in temporary accommodation. I, I, I record in, in the, the lower area. And when the AC or the heat kicks in, it's forced air. And this <clears> vent <throat> happens to be right there. And then it's like a rocket taken off. And I can't do anything. So my poor wife and, and son, who was with me over Christmas when I had to work, um, when I'm in my recording sessions, the heating's off. So that's, they're up there like this. <laughs> so I didn't, get, I didn't get any presents this year. <laughs> Got lots of advice. 
<laughs> the presents, did you buy them those spaces? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, oh, I, I bought them Teslas. <laughs> um, but the, that's it, exactly. It's noise. That's the number one enemy. Um, so it, it, it is. It's internal, it's external. It's, it's all those things you could think of. Vacuum cleaners. It's the next door dog yapping. It's uh, airplanes. Uh, it's the furnace kicking in. Um, it, it, it's... It's cars on the street, you know. Oh, and the worst in the summer is yard crews, yeah. the bane of my life. Um, and so, yeah, exactly, yeah, because no, nobody uses a rake these days. Right? Yeah. It's all so. So noise is is the biggest thing, and and therefore soundproofing becomes the next uh, becomes the key thing. So you can put a home studio pretty much anywhere as long as you can proof it, and you don't have to be fancy proofing it. I don't know if you remember there what used to be a, a grungy old place on Route 9 called Building 19 and Three Quarters. I used to sell the cheapest, most horrible stuff. I'm sure what I got was complete, it would have destroyed my lungs if I'd had it up for much longer, but it was cheap. So I put it all around the walls, put a bit of old carpeting they sold on the floor, and uh, then it's duvets. I put a couple of old single mattresses, whatever it takes, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, no one's going to see it. But they'll tell you, uh, they'll tell you soon enough if the sound quality isn't good. So you can, you, can, you can set a home studio up anywhere, really, give or take. And if the worst comes to the worst, the furnace kicks in, you have to stop recording until it kicks out again, kicks off again. Um, the other, one of the other issues with the booth, uh, or, or any space you record in, is going to be uh, temperature. In the winter, it's not so bad, because I have... Uh, next time I do my setup, I'm going to take some of this equipment out. But I have some, as you can see, I have several pieces of equipment in the booth. And actually, that alone generates a reasonable amount of heat during uh, the winter months. In the summer, it gets pretty... Uh, it's like, um, what's that um, yoga workout they do now? It's like 300 know, degrees. Hot yoga. Hot yoga, yeah. Bikram yoga or whatever it's called. So it's like that. So you don't want to see my attire when I'm in the summer in full <laughs> flow. Um, but so, so, so temperature, you can't really do much about. I, I, in the book, I talk about, I have a technique called KTDO. So you get to the end of a chapter, you kick the door open, you get a little bit of air coming in, <laughs> and then you shut it and get going again. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's the home studio. Now, we talked, uh, you know, talked about ACX and, and doing some work for these uh, volunteer companies. Um, so you can, you can find things to do very easily. How much does it cost to do it? As it turns out, very little to begin with. What I've shown you here, as it says, is the bare bones setup. Assuming you have either a desktop or a laptop, um, you've, got, you've got the most important thing. You can buy a microphone. That microphone there is a, is a make called, Behring, uh, called Behringer, and it uh, retails for about 60 bucks, and it'll give you perfectly good enough sound. It's what's known as a USB mic, so it just plugs into one of these sockets in your, in your <coughs> computer. The uh, software on the right-hand side is a software called Audacity, and Audacity you can record with and get very good quality sound, and it's absolutely free. It doesn't have all the functionality <coughs> that you might want, but when you're starting out, it gives you everything you need. Uh, and you can, you can record whole books on this software, and it's a free download. Uh, they have very, very helpful uh, how-to online help sections and, and so on and so forth. So. If you've already got a laptop, you can get yourself started up for about 60 bucks, and you're good to go. You can produce files, and you can start volunteering. And that may be where you end, you, know, you stay at, that's, that's fine. If you do progress, or you want to progress, then you get to, this is my setup, basically. So now you're talking about, I, I guess it's probably about three grand's worth of equipment here you're looking at. Uh, but if you're working regularly, the payback is very quick. So the going top row, left to right, the, the disc thing with the Apple, that's a Mac, an Apple Mac Mini, so that's a computer. It just doesn't come with a screen or anything else. So I had a separate monitor. The microphone is called a Shure KSM32. Um, you don't need to know much more about it than that, other than that it's a mid-range, good quality mic. It cost about 1,500 bucks. What was the name of the Sure, KSM32. What was the name of the first microphone? Uh, Behringer, B-E-H and then Ringer. Um, it is, sorry about that, hold calls. It is the C-1U uh, studio condenser mic. 
yeah, so that's the microphone. From the bottom left, Pro Tools software. Pro Tools is, is, is one of the industry standards for not only audio, but for voiceover, for music. Uh, it's just a tremendously popular, inordinately powerful tool. Using this is like having a sledgehammer to crack a nut. But <clears throat> it gives you that ability to re-record and record over, and it has just functionality is fantastic. So that's what I use for that. The, the two pieces next to it, the top box is... Um, is called the interface no it's not the top box is the i'm blanking on it but the top box is what powers the microphone basically a uh, microphone in and of itself isn't isn't powered but the 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 that device that Pre says grace it's a pr thank you it's a preamp yeah it's a preamp so it powers the microphone yes the, um, um, you mentioned punch and roll is that only available on pro tools versus it, not audacity correct okay yeah, that's one of the big that's differences. One of the, that's one of the big yeah. features. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you can get it on other software too, but yeah. Pro Tools has it. It seems like it would pay for itself. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, in spades. Is, is Pro Tools the Adobe product? Or is yeah. That, it is. Okay. Yeah. Is yeah. Your, uh, no, it's, a, it's Avid. Avid, okay. So yeah. Adobe is... I've heard people mention the Adobe product. Yeah, they have one. Uh, uh, Apple has one, actually. Uh, so you like Pro Tools best? Sony has one. I've only ever used it, to be honest. I, I just, again, I, well, I'll come on to this in a second. I got advice, and that's the advice I took. Um, the, the box on the bottom is the audio interface. So basically, when you record into the uh, microphone, it's, an, uh, it's a wave, it's a wave, you know, an audio wave, an analog sound. The microphone takes it, puts it uh, through that audio interface, which transforms it into a digital sound, something that you can manipulate on your recording software. That's fundamentally it. So it allows you to, to, to mess around with... Uh, uh, with the, the vocal sound. And this last box on the right is the external hard drive. Uh, this is a lifesaver, and you never record to the device that is powering your system in case it breaks down. You always record to an external device. I actually have two of these, so I, 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 I have the department of redundancy department. So I back up once, and then I back up in a different format again. I'm mindful of the time. It's 3.30, right, Kathy? Wait. We're good? Okay. Do you guys okay if I run over a little bit? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not going to... Six o'clock? No. <laughs> <laughs> so do you EQ yourself in... Uh, no. In no? No. EQ is equalization. Yeah. Uh, the other common uh, technique would be compression. Right. I don't do that. I d you do have to do that for ACX. And you can learn to do it in you know, the day minimus. But I don't. No, it's another thing. So, and I'm glad you raised that. Because here's my... Big, uh, big, um, what is it, advice, whatever you want to call it. So anybody that gets to this point that wants to then set up a professional grade studio, I have two, unless you're technically sophisticated, I have two <coughs> comments. Number one, oh, it actually is one comment, get help. Uh, and number one, what I did was I went to a professional company, they're actually in Wellesley, uh, called Parsons Audio, and I went to them and I said, I need to set up a studio, tell me what I've got to do. And you know, you're not going to let them sell you the absolute top end of everything, but uh, they advised me on all the equipment. Number two, I then paid for somebody to come into my home to set the gear up, sort out Pro Tools, download, and calibrate the recording. And then, uh, think, gentlemen in the back, you asked a question earlier on about the settings. Are they the same? You will... On the forums, you'll hear narrators talking about, oh, you know, if you tweak this and you do that, and you put a card in here, and I put this box in there, and I'm like, but that's not the business I want to be in. I don't get paid to do that. So my mantra is set it up and have the least to do with it as possible. And so my settings are the same for every single publisher. And that's all they want anyway. They want from you what they call raw audio, which is uh, unadulterated audio, no compression, no effects whatsoever. They do all that their end. Because when you get the, compression, the um, corrections back and they give you with that voice reel, and you hear yourself, oh my God, yeah. Huh, even sounds quite good. <laughs> but, um, but that's because they've done all the, that trickery with it their so end. You don't do any normalization or anything like that? Though? Nope, nope, nope. Uh, and, and that allows me to concentrate on getting as much narration done as possible, which allows me to invoice for as much money as possible. <laughs> it's a beautiful relationship. What do they require uh, when you're actually sending them the files, the publishers? Uh, so you send them the email, or do they give you... 
Uh, no, you can't email because the files are too big. They, 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 you do it either through these device, uh, you know, resources like Dropbox or Box or WeTransfer files. Um, m many of the clients I work for have their own FTP sites, uh, and so that's just another way of transferring files. So that, so then you, you, you just upload them to their FTP server. So if you don't need a separate fiber connection or something, you can do it through your home internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just. Uh, can I put in an MP3 file? Uh, the, the, the different ones that want different for, file formats. The only two I work with with uh, clients are WAV files, and they also want a, a couple of them want me to uh, convert into what's called FLAC. It's, it, all conversion is is it compresses the file size down, and then they take them and they expand them out again. So, that, but that's it. Yeah, it's WAV and FLAC. That's um, that's that's all I do. Okay, so I'm going to move on as quickly as I can now. So. Just a couple of words about marketing. Um, you may not all be able to see the caption. The caption says, my resume is not all lies. My name is correct. Hmm. So I think that's what probably most people's view of marketing is. But um, here's my golden rules for marketing. Number one, uh, it's your responsibility to let your clients and your prospective clients, people you want to work for, know who you are, where you are, and what you're capable of. It's your responsibility. It's not theirs to find you. Nobody is ever going to beat a path to your door. Well, they might for some people, but they don't for me. And they probably won't for you. So, so that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, and this is absolutely critical, people buy from people they know, like, and trust. And it is a huge cliche, I know, but it's hugely true. So, why is that important? Well, in the context of audiobook narration, if you go, remember that slide I showed earlier with all the logos of the uh, publishers? Those publishers get together once a year at an event called the uh, APAC conference, the Audio Publishers Association conference. Usually it's in New York. And I couldn't believe it when I first went to this thing. I got all these narrators I was listening to, the top narrators, and I thought, these guys are superstars. They're the rock stars of the business. I'd love to talk to some of these. And one of them is a Brit, funnily enough, a guy called Simon Vance. So I went to this conference, blow me down. The whole industry's there. And I'm walking around, and this Simon Vance, he comes past me. I think, oh, Simon. <laughs> um, but, it, but everybody is there. And it's not just, you know, a lot of trade shows I've been in my previous lives, you, get, you don't get CEOs, you get the sales guys or whatever. You don't want to talk to them because they're trying to sell something. So, you, so here you get the people you want to talk to. They're the, they're the production people, they're the casting directors, and they are priceless. They're the people that are going to give you work. And it's all there. In one day, the whole conference, the whole industry is there. And you can talk to the other you know, star narrators and pick their brains on stuff as well. I said to Simon Vance, I think it was the second one, I didn't pluck up the courage of the first one, the second conference I went to, I said to him, Simon, I'd like, how do I, how do I be like you? Because this guy wins awards every minute, it seems. And he said, well, you could change your name to Simon Vance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wise guy. Another Brit, typically. Uh, so, so, people who know, like, and trust you, that's the way to get in front of them. These uh, publishers get uh, between 200 and 300 submissions, uh, unsolicited submissions, a week. So think of what your chances are of getting anywhere from that slush pile onto their desks and a proper listening. They do say they, they listen to them or they have people listening to them. But the best way is just to go there, meet them, press the flash, have a quick hello, give them a card, and then you can do a little bit of a follow-up afterwards. It's what, in marketing terms, is what's known as dealing with a warm body. So you've got some connection. What I used to do earlier, early days, I used to send postcards. Every time I got a review in Audiophile magazine, I'd shoot a postcard out to them. I wouldn't ask for business. I'd just send it to them, say, I thought you might like to see my latest review. And that, that's that. And it just keeps you above the slush pile a little bit. Um, so the most important thing for marketing yourself in the whole of the audiobook business is a demo. Uh, if a publisher is going to take you on, they're going to take you on on one thing only, that's what your voice sounds like and how good you are at reading. And, and that's where you need uh, to prove that in a demo. This comes from my website, so this, this is where people can go to access demos from all sorts of different genres and, and, and so on. Um, these days, hardly anybody ever wants a CD, so that's... A, that's, that's a, that's really is a saving, um, and you, you know you can do it uh, on a, on the basis of sending files and so on. 
Um, you just have to be sensible. Don't, you know, don't do the latest blockbuster as a demo. Uh, don't do some of the classics because most of those have been done. Um, and don't send the wrong content to the wrong people. You know, don't send an erotica clip to Christian audio. <laughs> um, but other than that, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot that I could say about this, but I, I think you can, you can go a long way with a home studio, a demo that you do a bit of work on. And again, you don't have to techni technically mess it around <clears throat> and, and, and then you can start submitting them. Um, and and it, it, it'll, it'll sell you, it'll sell you. Um, so you don't, uh, uh, as I say, you don't need to do uh, CDs, but you do need to develop a little bit of a cover email, you know, a little bit of a message in the email that you send when you do do your follow-ups. And what I like to do is I like to try and work out what, what's their main areas of interest, if, they're, if they do have particular areas of interest. And then I'll say, well, I've done books in this genre that you also publish, and here's why you might be interested. You know, some, something that makes that kind of a connection. Now, um, these, uh, for any wannabes again, these are the two organizations that will take you as far as you need to go. Uh, Audio Publishers Association is uh, uh, open for narrators to join, and that's the organization that does the annual conference. Audiophile Magazine is the industry's magazine. It has reviews of tons of audiobooks every month. It also has a neat feature. They're online too, Audiophile. Uh, has a neat feature where in the print version, if you've got one of these readers, you can just scan that, that strange crossword-like thing and it'll uh, bring up a clip onto your, uh, onto your cell phone or whatever. But if, if you're online on, a, on their website, you can hear the clip straight from the website. So it's, it's fantastic. And as a budding narrator, there's nothing better than listening to the best people reading. You can learn so much from that and that alone. Uh, so that's, um, that's that. Uh, you, know, that, you know, not to begin with, and I still don't do as much of this as I should, but you, social media now is becoming more and more important. Publishers like doing it. So this one I put up for a number of reasons. So going from the very top line, I know it's small, but it says at the very top, Julia London liked. Julia London is the author of this book, Wild Wicked Scott. B Audio, the second line underneath, is the publisher. So they're the people who came to me and said, would you do it? So they're the ones who've put this tweet up. Um, and so they're promoting the fact that it's uh, new to audiobook. Uh, this is her novel now available through Harlequin Audio. Harlequin Audio, sorry, B Audio is the producer. Harlequin Audio is the publisher. It's actually an imprint of Harper Audio. So now you've got, you know, you've got the author covered, you've got the producer covered, you've got the publisher covered, and then very nicely they say, pleasure to work with narrator Derek Perkins. So you, then now they give him a bit of a shout out to the narrator. So that's, that's what the industry increasingly is doing. I find it tough because, you know, there's thousands, there's hundreds of narrators bu busily producing books and you just don't quite know what to say to make it sound different, you know, other than like a self-puff, oh, look at the book I'm doing now. So I, I struggle with that a little bit, but I will tell you that it took me months to get into shape for that photo shoot. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, I can't tell you, hardest job I ever had. So. <laughs> Um, Which one are you? <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Time's running out. Uh, so very quickly, this is what my day looks like too. So you've seen the inside of the studio. This is what I look at pretty much all day long. This is a screenshot of a Pro Tools. Uh, Pro Tools, and uh, each of these are um, tracks, I, and each of those has a chapter of the book on it, fundamentally. Uh, the sound waves there show, you know, show when you're recording, when you're not recording. So if you're doing a, if you do, to, to the, the question about how do you do uh, corrections, th this is where you know where to put your correction. You always get the blank space, check that you haven't got an intake of breath or an exhalation or something. Then you're going to put your cursor in there, you mark that section, there's another line window there, and then you roll it in and you do the correction and it's, and it's dropped in uh, there and then. So that's Pro Tools, it, as I said, immensely powerful. Um, I, I don't want to talk much more about it other than I, I set up a template for every session or, or that I use for every session. So I'm not setting up templates fresh for every book. It's just I bring one up. And the only thing I put in is the, chap is the, all, the, sorry, the book name for each of the chapters. Um, that's pretty much all I need to do with it. Uh, 
What else? Scheduling. Here's my holy grail. This is actually the spreadsheet I've developed and I use for my, to keep myself uh, in business and on track. A few things quickly about this. You'll see uh, underneath narration schedule on the left-hand side, it says finished hours. And underneath that, it says planned hours. So this is the trick. So the, the publisher will tell you how long the book's going to last when in its final form. So on the first, first column there, it's saying 14 hours. In planned hours, you can see I've allocated 18 to it. And that's my cushion for getting it right and in a decent format to send to the, to the publisher. Um, it also gives me a slight cushion because I know I'm going to do it quicker than 18 hours in most cases. So s sometimes if a publisher then, another one comes to me and says, can you do this book? I can compress these times a little bit and be flexible with my schedule and take on even more work, which is nice. Um, the weekends are marked off. I try to... I try to mark when I've got events going on in my personal life, if they're important, um, like on November the 7th there, Monday, November 7th, there's a little triangle in the corner. It probably tells me it's a, it's a chorus practice, actually, uh, just so I know I've got to finish by a certain time. And then, uh, yeah, I know, it's pretentious, isn't it? Oh, another <laughs> awards. Oh, God. Uh, but it, this happened to be one of the awards things, so I obviously make sure that I remember those. Um, and that's, that's it. As I finish books, I delete the columns. So it's only ever current. Yes? Do you, after you've finished, what do you do in terms of going back and listening? You said you go back for your own mistakes. Do you have to listen to the whole thing? No, 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 no. I catch my mistakes as I'm recording. So as you're doing yeah. them. And then, then I send so the files. So you don't go back and listen to the no. book once you're finished? No, no. Thank goodness. No. <laughs> I hate listening to myself. But no, you don't. The publisher does all that. Um, so that uh, is pretty much it. I, I thought you might be interested. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. Invoicing. Oh, the nicest part of all. <laughs> um, you know, what's to say about this? Other than uh, the invoice here is set up so that it very nicely, I drop in the time, the hours and minutes. There's a rate here, and then it'll automatically calculate the amount. And then I shoot that off to the publishers, and they end up sending me money. Um, I will say it's one of the best industries I've worked in for that. Uh, I've hardly ever had to wait beyond about three weeks for payment. Um, I never had to chase for payment. Sometimes uh, I get payment even before I expect it. So it, it's a wonderful business from that point of view too. It's, it's just, just human. Um, okay, so final thing. I wondered if you'd like to know or hear that it doesn't all happen. <coughs> magically and it's not all good on the day right so I, I, if you'd like I'll play you some quick uh, extracts of what does go wrong first one here I call this the emergency stop these are all real these aren't these aren't made out these are all real call this the emergency stop this is unlikely to have been true not least because the entire endeavor was character up <laughs> I don't know I can't explain it uh, this is what I call the warbler it seemed plain to Hume that beasts, like all normal people, are... <laughs> uh, this one's just unfortunate. So she shat. <laughs> <laughs> and that was in a romance. <laughs> uh, this one is where I developed a, a lisp unexpectedly. People have been quarreling about educating. <laughs> and this one is my saliva slurp. Ceausescu and his cronies dominated 20 million Romanians for four... <laughs> <laughs> Lovely, isn't it? Think of that as you're having dinner tonight. Uh, failure to launch is the next one. We must on be... <laughs> <laughs> Followed by the sudden stammer. The name of the... <laughs> and then the unexpected peter out. That is, it is not meant as a stand. <laughs> and this is what the comedians call corpsing. It's when you just crack up. Here, it might be remarked. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, this is the most serious book. George Muller is a, is a, is a fairly well-known uh, religious figure, and I don't know what it was it made that, but it was. Uh, this one is just, I have no idea what happened here. It's what I call a complete failure to make any coherent sound. <laughs> this is the uh, warning that you have to mute your f phone. I think this is the one, yeah. Mute your phone. If you don't, this happens. Rising into the sky, which was blue and clear and lit by the big sun of the place she'd only ever known as... 
<laughs> a bit faint, but it was my alert kicked in. Just, you couldn't, the timing couldn't have been better. And then, this is what happens when you're not sure if something's got into your studio. Men who worked in the service of, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> So there you go, the wonderful world of audiobook narration. So that's, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming. If any of you are interested, <laughs> if you would like to learn more, there are copies of the book available. I'd be very happy to let you have them for a nominal fee. Uh, and again, thank you for coming. Yes.